Well, I may be speaking from the back of the chamber today, but as I predicted last time I was here, in the European elections, the Brexit party were very much to the front of the elections and massive, massive winners. And I come back to a place that has been humbled and humiliated. The European Council stitch-up has rendered this place impotent until today, when you've got some real power if you choose to use it. What you've seen from Ursula von der Leyen today is an attempt for the European Union to take control of every single aspect of our lives. She wants to build a centralised, undemocratic, updated form of communism that will render nation-state parliaments where the state controls everything, where nation-state parliaments where nation-state parliaments will cease to have any relevance at all. I have to say from our perspective, in some ways, I'm really rather pleased because you've just made Brexit a lot more popular in the United Kingdom. Thank God we're leaving. But it is in the aspect of defence that I think people's minds should be focused. She's a fanatic for building a European army but she's not alone. When it's completed, NATO will cease to exist or have any relevance in Europe at all. And of course, not to be left out of this, French President Emmanuel Macron, on Bastille Day last Sunday, stood at the front of an open-top car with his nascent European Defence Force behind him, looking for all the world like an updated version of Napoleon. <laughs> Be in no doubt, be in no doubt, five years of these people, the European Defence Union will be complete. And what is there for defence can also be used for attack. And you as a House will have no control over it. Vote against this nominee, strike a blow for democracy, strike a blow for your citizens. Grazie, Do it today. Thank you, Mr Farage, says the President. E adesso I would like now to give the floor to Miss von der Leyen asking her to respond to the comments made by the heads of political groups. Go ahead, madam. Thank you, president. To be quite honest with you, having listened to the last speaker, that provides further proof how just important how important it is that we continue to work closely with our British colleagues in the future. But I think, Mr Farage, we can probably do without what you've got to say here. And that's what I find beautiful about Europe. Here in our Europe, countries come together. They come together on a voluntary basis. Nobody has forced them to come together. All our countries know that strength is in unity. By working together, we can defend the values which are close to all of our hearts and which brought us together. The great challenges facing us in the world are so enormous that none of us alone can face up to them. Only by working together, by cooperating, can we develop the strength, the soft power, which is uniquely European and which is at the very heart uh, of our European values. That's the source of our strength. That's why it's possible for us to talk about an optimistic future. This is why it's so important that we deploy our strength to guarantee a better future for our children. Let me now pick up on some of the subjects referred to. The social market economy. This is one of the great characteristics, the unique, unique characteristics of the European Union. This powerful link between a strong economy and our other values. Everybody knows, however, that in this economy everybody has to work hard and we have to ensure that the fruits of our hard work be given back to the people. That's the key idea of the social market economy. The social pillar of the social market economy is something which is supported by the Commission, the Parliament and the Council. There's a clear commitment to continue to support this system. We have to work with determination to defend that. Obviously, we're still far from perfect, but we are determined to identify shortcomings in the social pillar so as to correct them, and that must be one of our overarching priorities. We've heard as well about sustainability directives. Here, once again, these are light motives on our policy making. 
sustainability objectives surely are something which all of us must support. I think it must be clear to everybody now that the clock is ticking. Time is running out. Our planet needs help urgently. We, th our whole life and society is built on natural resources which are under threat. We have to ensure that we can deal with these resources in a sustainable, protective way. This is why it's so important that we all recognize the value of sustainability objectives and we should all do our utmost to pursue them. As far as the progressive approach is concerned, the two-step approach is concerned, we have to ensure those two steps be in rolled out in parallel. This is why recently I've said that we have to start by tackling this in the European Parliament. However, we all know that we need major players in the world if we are to move forward with these objectives. This is why it's important that the European Union can and must take a leadership role. That's the only way to bring about change. The Paris Climate Agreement represented a unique coming together of the powerful in the world. Let's continue to draw on the spirit of Paris, the ideas of Paris, to try to uh, defend our future. The second enormous challenge facing us is digitalization. Here, once again, we have to stand united. On the one hand, we need to be able to draw on those people in society who are able to thrive with digital uh, the new digital world who promote our economy. At the same time, we have to ensure that the digital economy be protected with ethical rules concerning artificial intelligence, cyberspace. We have to ensure that we have robust measures so as to ensure that that protects everybody. And we as Europeans have to become major players in the cyber world. We know there are many risks in the cyber world, major risks for our economy or indeed major risks for our society. Here once again none of our states alone are able to face up to those challenges. Only by working together can we succeed in laying the foundations of a secure future that what our, which our people deserve. The human dimension of digitalization must be the primary objective of our economy. We have to protect our people. Somebody who works must be given protection. And we now have to find ways of ensuring that the values which have always protected workers in the existing economy be transferred to the digital economy. How can we defend platform workers, cloud economy workers? We have to ensure that we can transfer that protection for the benefit of all of our citizens. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I listened to all the speakers very clearly. When I heard Mr. Moyton speaking, I must say I was quite relieved to hear that you won't be voting for me. Since everything you said goes contrary to my deepest values.